Welcome to Codex X, the video game history podcast. My name is Dux, and I am your host. And this is... Tyler, and I am your co-host. <laughs> I should stop saying, and th this is... <laughs> and this... This is... <laughs> Vegan Tyler. Yes, um, what kind of podcast is this, Tyler? Why are we doing this? Uh, this is a video game history podcast where each episode we delve into uh, a piece of video game history or culture uh, that you may not have heard about before. Yeah, that's pretty fun. And one person tells the story and the other person listens. Yep. And usually we start out by asking how we are. And I'm, well, how are you, Tyler? How's, how are things in your life? I'm doing okay. Uh, busy as always. Gaming-wise, I've been really sucked into uh, two games at present. I restarted an, uh, a playthrough of Final Fantasy VIII, which I think is the only one you said you've played, right? Mm, yeah. And then I've been switching to that and an indie game called Return of the Obra Din, which was gifted to me by one of our regulars. It's on my wish list. Oh man, it's so cool. It's one of the only games I don't want to talk about because I know it has chunky spoilers. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So, are you cool with talking about the premise rather than? <laughs> yes, I know the okay. premise. You go on okay, the well... and there's murders and shit like that. Yeah, well, it's good. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I was just no, like, I don't know no, how. You don't say another word, Tyler. I will. I only want to know the name. <laughs> I only buy games based on their names. Say the name a second time, and I will quit this podcast right now. <laughs> Return of the Oprah. Don't leave me, ducks. <laughs> Um, okay, for those of you who don't know what this game is, I'll just be very brief. It's like a, an investigative game. You're like an 1800s magical insurance adjuster is the best way I can put it. Yeah. And you are sent to figure out what happened to everybody on a ship. And they give you this pocket watch that you can see the exact moment of someone's death. And so um, visually, it's like a one bit style. Like it's literally like each pixel is either black and black or white. And then they like make like a 3D uh, environment out of that. It's very cool. And so anyway, then your job is to go and figure out who each person was and how they died. But you may not be able to figure that out without context clues from like all these other chapters. And so you're like zipping around and trying to figure out who people are based on clues, based on things somebody said. And so, um, you know, what, what clothes they were wearing, what cabin they walked out of. Like, it's really cool. Um, I'm not a big puzzle fan guy, but I really liked it. But you also have to sometimes bang your head against it at times. So yeah. anyway, really cool game. What about you? I'm good. I'm playing Final Fantasy XIV right now, which I regret a bit, but I'm, I like the game. Another thing, though, is I suggested to Tyler to do a segment before we start the podcast. Like, let's do a segment, Tyler. And yeah. um, the segment is called What the Fuck's Going On in the Video Game World? And <laughs> it goes like this. Is that our of official us, name? <laughs> I just came up with it. and I think it's a good name. Oh. Um, oh, okay. <laughs> and it goes like this, that each of us says two things that he noticed in the video game world. And uh, he wants to know if the other person can relate to that. And I'm going to start with my part. And my part is, have you noticed how the video game, like the, the video game market is completely oversaturated? And the like, who there's more games than there's people on this planet and how how are these games competing for our attention and how do they profit from that who where does the money come from i fear that this is like the harbinger of the next video game crash because we have to do a, uh, an episode about the video game crash at some point yeah and it was the same than that it was the, the what's, what's going on can you relate to that so i can relate to the absolutely massive amount of video games out there right now but <clears throat> i would say that um some of that might be simply due to how easy it is to publish a game now like not make a game but to just put a game out there oh. um imagine if okay you wanted to publish a game in the 90s right i've been doing all these segments on game consoles in the 90s how do you do that uh, you either a publish it on PC and you got to get, you, you know what it hangs on a pegboard in a baggie or, you know, you get trip Hawkins to publish it for you. Right. By you, right? Yeah. Right. Or, um, or you get it onto console and you have to go through all this stuff and, you know, there's like a rating system sometimes and depending on what year you're doing things and it's like a whole lot, you know, now these days, right. Anybody with a half baked idea can slap something on steam and you can buy it. 
And so I just think it's a lot, you know, maybe there would have been more games if it had been easier to publish them. So we have no way to know. Maybe it's infrastructure. Maybe, maybe. Yeah. Is there something that you think, like, what the fuck's going on in the video game world? I, I wonder if you, I don't know uh, how you feel at this, but like, do you think that large video game corporations have, have become like under higher scrutiny than they used to? Like, like, I feel like I remember the days of like, EA is the worst company ever, right? And like Time Magazine had it voted as like they're the worst company in the US, even in, though they like- In the year of the BP oil spill. I want to repeat that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right? And so, but like, I feel like maybe it's because like the internet circles that I'm in these days are different, but like, I just feel like it's like anytime a mega company like this fucks up, it, there's just so much attention now and and i don't know if it's that we're more in tune with that attention and like it's easier for us to see every single infraction than it used to be or if maybe we're becoming more savvy maybe this relates to your video game saturation you know why should i keep playing overwatch when there's a hundred other games that could scratch that itch for me that don't come from a company that turned out to be really shitty yeah I'm, I, f I feel similar like but i think companies in general are under more um, scrutiny and maybe i feel like that maybe because of that big video game companies will start something that other companies have started doing and that is maybe greenwashing themselves not in the green sense but trying to do these big pr campaigns about being socially just because there were these huge discussions about sexism and <clears throat> bad working conditions in the big companies. And maybe that will, that will change now because the scrutiny has increased. It feels, I feel the same. Well, I certainly hope that things do change, especially for the people in those industries, because clearly there have been massive widespread abuses for a long time that have been covered up. And, you know, it's not just Blizzard. It's it's everywhere. And so, uh, you know, I know that there's been talk about like the creation of game unions and things like that. And, and, you know, I think that, you know, hopefully progress is, is continuing to be made to help these people out. But yeah, it's really interesting. Like if you told me 10 years ago, oh, they're talking about unionizing video game voice actors and things like that. I'd be like, yeah, okay. That's not going to happen because it's the United States. Right. <laughs> um, but like now it actually feels like there is a groundswell of support for some of these things and so yeah i don't know i just it feels like the way that we view these corporations it's like there there are a lot less companies that i feel like are venerated than there used to be you know okay like can you think of a company like like blizzard mm -hmm. right like I, I keep coming back to blizzard but like imagine how much of a pedestal we used to put Blitter, blizzard up on i mean early blizzard games my god like i spent my childhood years on diablo and starcraft and just Oh. Yeah, we do kind of put the small like this, these successful small indie companies that keep putting out one good product, like the DRG guys, or Devolver Digital, mm -hmm. those guys. But maybe because they are still young, right? They haven't had time to become evil yet. <laughs> it's the cycle, right? They will either die a hero <laughs> or become the villain. <laughs> of course. Interesting. If one would like to contact us, and maybe make a, give us suggestions or maybe a perspective on their view on the video game world. How would they do that, Tyler? Yeah, so you can send us an email at codexrexpodcast at gmail.com. And like Doc said, if you ever have episode suggestions or there is something in the game industry you want us to talk about here at the beginning, um, give your perspective. You know, we can give our perspectives on it. Uh, shoot us an email, codexrexpodcast at gmail.com. You can also find us on Twitter at codexrexpodcast. And you can find me on Twitch at uh, I'm Vegan Tyler on Twitch. And that's about it. Cool. Do you maybe want to start the episode? Nah, nah, I think I'm good. Yep, yeah, it's good talking to okay. you. Okay. Have a good day. Yep. Uh, this has been episode 19. Um, I don't know where I'm going with this bit. Yeah, we can start whatever. <laughs> <laughs> Let's do this. Okay, so first off, if any of you are familiar, unfamiliar with the kinds of 
episodes I occasionally make, sometimes it takes a while for me to run into the actual video game part of this video game history podcast. And this is because I believe that the history of the people behind the video games gives us just as much insight about our hobby as the actual information about the game. Video games don't make themselves, right? Yeah. And today will be another one of those episodes where we will look through a bunch of history that all lead to something relevant about video games. So you got to stay with me a bit. Okay. Okay. This is an episode we have been approached for by somebody. Um, and I will give it my best shot. Okay. I believe. I believe in you, Docs. So do you remember how in the PDP-1 episode, we kind of came to the conclusion that Space War was the first video game? Yeah. Yeah, that's bullshit. That's incorrect. <laughs> okay. We will start that again, but we will do it differently. <laughs> All right. So let's, let's start this one by juggling some definitions. <laughs> so... We are discussing... <laughs> Correction. Are discussing... Take the PDP-1 episode and toss it in the trash. It's no, useless I'll delete now. It. I'll delete it tomorrow. It's going to be gone. <laughs> so we, we're discussing video games, right? But we never discussed the definition of what a video game is, right? The, the term consists of two words. It's video and game. And none of which are very helpful to come up with a strict definition. Though, according to Oxford languages, a video is a recording, a reproducing or broadcasting of moving visual images, which is a sound definition. Um, and as you might see, this partial definition alone already sends us into an endless chain of other definitions we might have to look up, like what is a recording, what is a broadcasting, what is a moving visual image. Um, but let's stick with this definition for now anyway because we, we, can, we can move on from there. We run into the same problem with the definition of what a game is. Right. Because when I, when I got my degree in education, we had this whole course about what a game is and what may be defined as play. But in the end, I kind of found this definition rather um, helpful. Uh, maybe you agree. A game is an activity that one engages in for fun. That's it. Activity that one engages in for fun. I don't know that I would call a game that. I mean, I think that a game is obviously something you can engage in for fun, but like an activity one engages in for fun could literally be anything. I ate some toast this morning and it was enjoyable to me. Is that a game? That's a very good problem about this definition because if you look at this for too long, you will always find, you can easily think of things where you're like, this is definitely not a game, right? but I'm still doing something and it's fun. But we, we have to start at some point with a definition. We can't say a game is something that you play on a board with figures like chess, right. because then you would exclude other things. So you have to start very broad because games are a, a very broad concept that is really hard to define. It's true. So that's how, so, so I decided to just stick with this one for now. We will run into problems and we will try to resolve them. Okay. in a few moments oh i don't think you're wrong for picking this definition i think it's just it is very broad and you're right so by fusing these two definitions we kind of get an amalgamation of a of a definition that would kind of sound like this a video game is an activity one engages in for fun that requires a recording a broadcasting or a reproduction of moving visual images maybe you know why this gets us in trouble now we had this episode about the first video game already but by this definition, I can easily think of earlier video games. Because let's go back like 2,000 years. To be precise, let's move back to <laughs> okay. like to 500 BC to 500 AD, somewhere in what today is known as China. And a Chinese philosopher during this time accurately described the technology that we today call a camera obscura. Okay. And do you know what that is? I remember that <clears throat> during some haze in my dissertation i went and did this deep dive on camera obscura and mm -hmm. i can't remember a single thing that i looked up so this is gonna completely be fine all like i remember we were talking i think we were talking in the discord with pico about it and i went and did this whole dive on it so you can totally refresh me here and i'll go oh yes of course i remember this now <laughs> yes of course hit me so with the camera obscura is basically a dark room that has a hole on one side, a tiny hole. 
and the outside of the room is lit on the wall opposite to the hole will be a depiction of the inverted image of the outside because the light shines through the hole and um, gets beamed onto the other side. This works with no electricity. It, it happens randomly in nature by sometimes light shining through leaves. And you can do this in a tent and just a bit of sunlight. And this was known by humans and was humans were able to reproduce this effect 2,500 years ago. If, you, if this description is a bit unclear for you, just Google Camera Obscura for anyone who's listening. You'll find some neat images about it and even videos showing the optical effect, don't worry. But this effect of the Camera Obscura has been documented more than two millennia ago. And we have evidence that humans were capable of manipulating the optics around them on purpose and thereby reproducing moving visual images. By our definition, a Camera Obscura is video technology. But would you call that a video game? Because I would say that yeah, yeah. more akin to a movie, right? Oh yeah, wait, wait for it. Wait for it. <laughs> so, but but just watching an inverted image that comes from next door isn't a game, right? Yeah. Right. No, you're com you're completely correct. Well, not if you do nothing with it for fun. But there's another other cultural achievement that came up all over Southeast Asia during the same time, which is shadow play or shadow theater or shadow puppetry. And it's a very early form of theater. And supposedly it started out with people painting stories on cloth. And since those stories often were told at night, people put lamps behind the cloth to illuminate it. And after a while, they figured out that they could replace the figures they drew on the cloth with puppets that they held behind it in such ways that they cast a shadow. And you might say now, hey, Ducks, this is all great, but aren't video games like interactive? This is just theater. And so let's say, someone sold the game shadow puppetry on our favorite game distribution platform um like buy shadow puppetry today on steam get a free oil lamp for your pre <laughs> pre-ordering today <laughs> and reviews overwhelmingly positive and game tags do you know which game tag it would have uh story rich <laughs> <laughs> i thought you were gonna make a rogue like a rogue like joke <laughs> Because everything's a rogue like these days. <laughs> yeah, or or, or souls like. It could also be souls like. <laughs> <laughs> um you know that, that game is ten years old now, by the way. Dark Souls. So yeah, it's it's yeah. it's story rich, souls like and um folk like. Yeah. <laughs> shadow shadow puppetry. <laughs> like, just just watching something does not mean it's not a game. That's what I'm trying to say. Right. Interaction is not part of being a game. And a game can be non-interactive. Right. So watching and listening is an activity in itself. And as long as you do it for fun, it's a game by our definition. So movies are a game. See, I would disagree with definition. Right. By the, by the textbook definition that we're going with, sure. But I would say that if you can't interact at all, then they're not a game, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. that is, I, I have an episode prepared about this if games need players, mm -hmm. but let's for now say, I, I, I see that there's a discussion here that's very good, um, but for now say that games do not need players. Okay, I'll save all my disagreement for that episode. Yes, games can either play themselves or playing the game can also just be watching the game. I, I just don't know about that. I, like if I'm watching I don't know, somebody play a game on Twitch, I'm not playing the game. Or if I turn a game on and it plays itself, I'm not playing the game. Like Death Stranding has like hour long cutscenes near the end, but I had to play to get to them. And that's the allure. Like if I was just watching, you know, uh, Norman Reedus schlep around as, you know, cutscene the game, I don't know that it would have the same impact as like carrying packages over that mountain, you know? Yeah. Let's say. We live in 500 BC, and we watch a sh we, we watch shadow puppetry, mm -hmm. and one person is doing something with the puppet, and there's a narrator, and the narrator says thing says things, and maybe kind of improvises them, and the person that does the sh does the puppetry follows that command. Is the narrator a player? Is the shadow puppetry a game? So <clears throat> now we're talking about we could do like I mean, is like D and D a game? I would say yes right and that's a collective storytelling experience um mm -hmm. 
That to me sounds like it could be. I mean, yeah, if if imagine that you play D&D and you never rolled a single die, right? I would still call it a game. You're still sitting around and you're all collectively influencing the story. So in such a in such a shadow puppet um <laughs> uh, thought experiment, uh yeah, I could see that being a game. Yeah, I I do not demand this to be entirely right. And this is not okay. where this episode is going. It's I'm totally just fine. saying if if we broaden our horizon a little bit and get uh -huh. some and, and 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 tolerate a few different ideas about what a video game might be mm -hmm. and make our model of what a video game is a bit loose, all of a sudden everything can be a video game. Right. That's the point I'm making. And this point gets us into a huge problem as video game history podcast producers because mm -hmm. where, where the fuck do we start this is this doesn't make any sense anymore so obviously shadow property is no video game well this is why this is why definitions are really important and why yeah. what definition you choose can greatly affect your you know greatly affect your outcome for example uh something i teach in one of my classes is the question of how many wars the united states has been in and it is a you'd say oh there's tons and the, the answer is it's a very small number depending on your definition right and so this is something that yeah. when we study stuff across the world like how do you determine what a war is is it congress went through the proper channels and crossed all their t's and dotted all their i's and submitted legislation and whatever and declared war is it uh, they sent troops in. Is it a certain number of casualties? Is it a certain amount of money spent? Like once you change that definition, you change what the number is at the end. And so that's really important. And that's why definitions are important. So that when somebody says, I made a video game, <laughs> you know, you generally have a pretty good idea of what that would be, but definitions matter, right? Definitions matter very much. But one last thing about this is, um, if we stick with this definition and we say Shadow Property is the first video game, okay. then we've actually proven that Space War isn't and just because it's an electronic device. And we've not proven it, but we, we came to an acceptance of that. Okay. And, but if you ever feel, felt like you were, you were like too much fun on parties, and I, I recommend interrupting anyone who claims that they like retro games, instantly, elegantly pop out a flashlight and an handkerchief and use a Sharpie to paint dick butt on it and show off some of your sick retro shadow property skills because true retro gaming requires only the power of light. <laughs> this is why you don't go to parties anymore, isn't it, Docs? It's not because of COVID. Yeah. This, <laughs> is, this, is how, this is how I never got invited to any social gatherings anymore. Yeah, so um, when we were at grandma's, uh, you know, after party, after the wake, um, we really thought it was kind of inappropriate that you kept doing your dick butt shadow puppets on the <laughs> wall. And like, you kept saying that she'd like it and she was really into video games, but we're just really not so sure. And so, you know, we think that you should probably not come to Christmas this year. <laughs> yeah, it's funny. It's funny because it's true. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, is, is, so is this the end of the episode? Yep. Will we now have to untangle everything that was done for laughs and giggles from 500 BC onwards that even slightly <laughs> used light to project moving imagery? No. <laughs> okay. First, we'd never see the end of it, as I said. And second, we are aware that what we call video games requires more to the definition than just the amalgamation of the word definitions it consists of. Like, is there anything that you'd add add to the definition aside from what we already have to make the video game make video games a modern achievement of the twentieth and nineteenth century only? So, I, I can repeat our current definition to help you out. Sure, it's uh, a video game is an activity one engages for fun that requires a recording, broadcasting, or reproduction of moving visual images. So, to me, I really think that interactivity is the most important part of a video game because otherwise it's mm -hmm. just a piece of art or a movie which i i stand by that games are a piece of art but i guess i'm thinking more of like a piece of art you'd hang in a museum or something but that also is especially true for you for games right this is not just for video games is there something that you can think of for video games um so i think i don't know how i would put this into a you know uh here i'm sitting i'm coming at this from like i'm writing a academic paper or something i don't know how i would write i don't know how i would write a definition that in my mind says that it needs to be on some kind of like modern tech does that make sense like it yeah. needs to be like it needs to be rendered graphics if that makes sense but 
for, for to be a video game like a the video game part of it not just a game the video game part of it has to be like rendered in some way like like graphics that are reproduced and rendered on some kind of technology that's exactly the point i would make okay and, and that is that the moving images that we talked about <clears throat> that those have to be caused by electronic manipulation of a device that's capable of creating optical effects like a monitor or a display I think that's just a complicated way of saying what you just said. But I actually think that was probably better than how I said it. So yes, we're, we're on the same page. Yeah, because I prepared it beforehand. That's, <laughs> that's why you, and I you woke had up, to come up with it on this one. I woke up, you know, drank a cup of coffee and I'm here. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah, I think we're fine here. Um, <laughs> so by, by this definition, we automatically can ignore anything that happened before the discovery of electricity. And yes, I know that archaeologists found batteries that date back to 150 BC, but those were not used to manipulate moving images. So right. <laughs> that's not be a party crasher here. I, I'm not allowed at enough households already. <laughs> but <laughs> we can safely ignore any visual technology from before the 18th century. And I felt doing this will give us the ability to know how far back we have to look to find evidence of video games. Our definition of a game remains just as broad, though. So now we have to look for the first device to electronically manipulate images. So let's move to Germany for that. Okay. Specifically to Münster. Over there, some dude called Johann Wilhelm Hittorf, who was a physics... I'm fuck. Could you fucking hit me with that again? That is the most German name I've ever heard. One more time. <laughs> Johann, which is the German version of John. Uh -huh. Wilhelm, which is the German version of William, and Hittorf, which is just his last name. <laughs> I love this guy already. Now tell me how horrible he is. <laughs> I think he's actually, I, I didn't look too much into his private opinions, but uh, I think he's kind of fine. Um, okay. He was a physics professor and he was experimenting with cathodes. Okay. Um, he, okay. Guy works on catheters. All right. Not catheters, cathodes, the negative electronic uh, pole of catheters that, that electrocute you all the listeners know what i'm talking about tyler <laughs> has his own little thing going on but we're not going to get into that so he kind of noticed that a cathode <laughs> okay can you actually explain to me uh, jokes aside i have no idea what a cathode is i'm just going to slap slap that ignorance down on the table if you have a if you have a battery okay you have a positive part and a negative part uh -huh. and the negative part is the cathode okay Dux is doing this yeah. thing with his hands. <laughs> he's just got two fingers and he's pointing at this battery that doesn't exist. It's cracking me up. Okay, but I appreciate that. Okay. Does the positive side have a name? Yeah, the anode. Okay. I didn't... Okay. Cathode and anode. I never knew that they had official names, but I should have assumed that. Cool. And he kind of noticed if he had his cathode that was in this little tube, that if he, if he put... Um, um, voltage on it, it would emit some kind of light ray, which cast a shadow on the wall of the tube it was surrounded by. Um, so in 18, 1869, he was able to show that these cathodes emit rays that go in straight lines. And this was all the rage. Like, you, you can produce light with these things? This is insane. And researchers all over the world started to do all kinds of experiments with these rays that were emitted by cathodes. Scientists learned what those rays consisted of and how to manipulate them using electronic and magnetic fields. And this all led up to a man we already heard before during the PDP-1 episode, whose name was Ferdinand Brown. And Ferdinand Brown, in 1897, he invented the Brown Tube, which we already talked about. And uh, it, was, it was kind of the first cathode ray TV thingy so it not even closely resembled what we would call a CRTV, CRT TV. And this, the brown tube caused a cascade of improvements on the technology. And this is the device we're looking for. This is this first video device that does what is in our definition. It um, manipulates moving images using electronics. Okay. Now we got to figure out when was this first used to build something that was used for an activity for fun? So we reach 1947. Two men 
named Thomas Goldsmith and Assel Mann register a patent for a device made from analog and electronics that simulate the flight path of artillery. Interesting. It's on one of those little cathode ray tubes. And by turning a little knob, one could change the flight path. It would be like a little ellipse. Mm -hmm. And this did not use any computing power. The turning of the knob directly manipulated the magnetic field that would manipulate the image on the screen. So no computers were needed. The goal of the hmm. game was to make the artillery shell hit little markers made of plastic that were actually glued onto the screen. Oh. They called this machine the CRT amusement device. What? Okay. Yeah. 19, 1947. It was never sold or even marketed, but it existed. This is 1947. This is before space war and before the PDP-1. Even before our friend Bear came back from Europe to come up with his TV game idea that only worked out much mm -hmm. later. Still, under most definitions, this is not considered a video game and thus also not considered the first video game. Under our definition, it is a video game though, because it does that thing that it manipulates the moving images. Right. So let's review our definition for a second. A video game is an activity you want to engage for fun that requires a recording, a broadcasting, or a reproduction of moving visual images that are caused by electronic manipulation of a device that's capable of creating optical effects like a monitor or any other display. That was a mouthful. But we are missing one thing that would make it a video game. And that would cast this one out. And that's not in our definition yet. I know this was big, but what do, like most, like I can make it easy okay. for you. Most video games that we play are played on something like a machine, mm -hmm. right? Something that um, has logic in, built in it. And this CRT amusement device had no computing power whatsoever. Mm. There was no logic involved. It was just a display that you just moved a thing. Just the display yeah. and a magnet that you. That makes sense, yeah. And most modern video game definitions add one more thing, and that is that some sort of computational device has to control it. Okay. Yeah, okay, I could see that, yeah. In many definitions, a video game runs on a computing device, and the CRT amusement device required none, so there's that. But we are we're so close to finding a video game that by all definitions preceded Space War, proving me wrong. And I said, I proved myself wrong, right? But wait, there's more. <laughs> Dim your lights, friends. This story is about to get intense. Okay. As fuck. Snuggle up, hold the hand of a loved one. You can hold yourself, yeah. Tyler. We are about to go for a wild ride into the life of the man who did the video game backflip quite a while before the PDP one. Okay. This one goes out to enamel. <laughs> Once every 75 years, Halley's Comet visits Earth and brings tidings of distant worlds far out of our reach. A glimpse upon a witness of places we'll never see. A long-haired rock in space which has been attributed with good as well as bad fortune. For example, in 1835, Halley's Comet visited Earth for a while, which is also when world-famous author Mark Twain was born. Halley's Comet left and Mark Twain spent 75 years living a life that to this day leaves joy in people's hearts when they read his stories. When Twain died in 1910, Halley's Comet returned to wish him farewell. Mark Twain died in Reading, Connecticut, and just one month prior to Twain's death, just 20 miles away from Reading in Bridgeport, Connecticut, another child was born that would also live underneath Halley's blessing. William Alfred Higginbotham was born in 1910. William might be a bit of an outlier among our protagonists because he wasn't into playing games. He was more of a musician. He learned to play the accordion at a young age and enjoyed playing it in his free time. He studied in Massachusetts at Williams College and gained an undergraduate degree in 1932. He went on to study physics at an Ivy League college, Cornell University, but when the USA entered World War II in 1941, he joined the radiation laboratory at the MIT. Wow. And as we know, yeah, this man has quite the career in front of him. And as we know, this war was entirely different from what humanity experienced in every other conflict so far. There was fighting going on all over the world, and aerial warfare was very prominent. 
If you fight on a scale like this, radar technology is essential to win the war. And William was an expert on that. But William didn't remain at the radiation lab. He was transferred to a very different project. But to understand it, we have to step back a few years. In 1938, four German scientists discovered the process of nuclear fission. Otto Hahn, Fritz Strassmann, Lise Meitner, and Otto Frisch. And nuclear fission is, in layman's terms, when an atom splits up into smaller atoms and other particles. And this pr process produces radiation and also tremendous amounts of energy. And the decay of chemical elements was already known, but being able to produce a chain reaction like this was completely different. This discovery alone made the thought of nuclear weaponry and nuclear power feasible. And this possibility wasn't publicly understood at the time, but scientists who read up on the discoveries of nuclear fission were quickly very alarmed about this, especially those scientists who were in exile far away from Germany, worrying even more deeply about the developments within Germany. So a bunch of scientists in the US teamed up and wrote the so-called einstein zilsart letter that was written to warn the US government from the threat of potentially extremely powerful bomb. And what they asked the government to do was to stockpile uranium and put the nuclear fission research on fast track to beat the Germans to developing the first nuclear bomb. And the USA, under the lead of Theodore Roosevelt, or Roosevelt. Um, I, think it's, I think it's Roosevelt. Roosevelt. Roosevelt is how we typically pronounce it. They decided to create a secret research project to develop the first nuclear bomb. And this was before the USA joined the war. The thought of what was coming from Germany, if the Germans would achieve to build this bomb, was so worrying that it pressured the USA into starting what today we know as the nuclear arms race. Just that at that time, it was not about building as many bombs as possible. It was at, at achieving building a bomb at all. Now let's go back to William. Yeah, what's William up to? What's, what's, he, what's, he, what's What does he got to do with this? Um, after his time at the university, he joined what is today known as, do you know the name of the project? The the Manhattan Project? The Manhattan, yeah, he joined the Manhattan Project. And the name of the that was the name of the American endeavor to create the first nuclear bomb. And he was part of the electronics department and even was promoted to the leading scientist of the electronics department of the Manhattan Project. But what was his team's job? They would create the timer that would trigger the nuclear chain reaction. The little device to bring devastation among thousands of people. And even though nobody ever saw a nuclear explosion before, these people knew what they were building. These people knew what war was, and they knew what a bomb was, and they all had degrees in theoretical physics and understood the principles of nuclear fission. They read that paper. On the 16th of July in 1945, in the desert of New Mexico, William and his colleagues completed the final checkups on this timer that they built that was already installed in the bomb. Do you know the name of the first nuclear bomb? Oh, um, I don't. Uh, I, hit me with it. I, I won't try to guess. <laughs> it's, it's, it's okay. It's, uh, it's called, it's a weird name. It's called the Gadget. Okay, I wouldn't have guessed that. Yeah, me neither. The Gadget. I was completely surprised by it. Okay. Yeah, and according to, like, it's, it's a code name, obviously, to, um, so you can write it in letters and people don't, get what you're mm, writing I about. see. And according to William on the drive to the observation site, none of them spoke. All of them, they knew what they, have, what they had built and none of them were proud of it. And this is a quote he gave later. For the entire drive, none of us spoke a word. There was nothing to say. William Higginbotham was one of the 425 people that actually witnessed the first detonation of a nuclear bomb, which were called the Trinity Test, was called the Trinity Test. And that's here two quotes about. I know this is a video game mystery podcast, but this is hey, too good to man. Not talk you about. told me to 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 wait and hang on and and be there for the ride, and I'm fucking holding on tight. Tell me more about Higginbotham. So there's two quotes about this explosion, the first nuclear explosion that ever happened on this planet. Um, this first is by Ralph Carlyle Smith, and he's watching from Compania Hill. And his description captures the experience very well. I was staring straight ahead with my open left eye covered by a welder's glass and my right eye remaining open and uncovered. Suddenly, 
My right eye was blinded by a light which appeared instantaneously, all about, without any build-up of intensity. My left eye could see the ball of fire start up, like a tremendous bubble or knob-like mushroom. I dropped the glass from my left eye almost immediately and watched the light climb upward. The light intensity fell rapidly, hence did not blind my left eye, but it was still amazingly bright. I turned yellow, then red, and then beautiful purple. At first, it had a translucent character, but shortly turned to a tinted or colored white smoke appearance. The ball of fire seemed to rise in something of toadstool effect. Later, the column proceeded as a cylinder of white smoke. It seemed to move ponderously. A hole was punched through the clouds, but two fog rings appeared well above the white smoke column. There was a spontaneous cheer from the observers. And there's another quote by R. Lugo, who was flying a Navy transport plane at 10,000 feet, about 30 miles away from Albuquerque. My first impression was like the sun was coming up in the south. What a ball of fire. It was so bright, it lit up the entire cockpit. And apparently, to get information, he radioed into Albuquerque and he was like, what's going on? And they just, the only thing that they told him was, do not fly south. <laughs> and he was like, okay, <laughs> no, no questions asked. <laughs> sure, don't have to tell me twice. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah uh, insane, unbelievable. And so back to William, he was there, he saw that. Yeah. And he was a pretty serious person in general all his life. He never enjoyed games. He was a very calm musician. He liked physics. He liked his research. But this experience changed him. And it changed many other people that experienced the Trinity test. And so he helped found a nuclear proliferation group called the Federation of American Scientists. Um, they kind of had the goal to regulate the worldwide production of nuclear weapons, especially after the first bombs were dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. There, they had the plan to put huge efforts into, into controlling this horror that they helped put into the world. So uh, I'm gonna say something here real quick. A uh, couple of years yeah. ago, I went to Japan um, with my fiance and my brother. And one of the things I specifically wanted to see was the uh, Hiroshima Museum that they have. Uh, that just like shows you the whole thing, how it went down. And um, if I truly think that it is something that every person should see in their life uh, because it humbles you, you know, I've never, I'm a guy who, you know, for a very long time wore a peace sign around my neck. So you can kind of get an idea of my thoughts on, you know, war, but uh, it's a humbling experience to see the stories of the people who were, you know, victims of these uh, of these bombs, and so I won't I won't go into a long diatribe because it'd be it'd be very depressing. Uh, and but man, you come out of that and you're just like, yep, never again. And and so you still see the shadows on the walls. Yeah, right? the shadows of the people that got blasted. What's so what they do really well is they they have all of these artifacts from from people and so like there's like for example there's a room and there's this one room and it's just full of like articles of clothing and possessions of like children who died in, in the blast and then mm. there's a story for each child and it tells you like what their life was like who they were related to um where they lived what they were doing that day how they died and it's like it's it's like the most humbling experience of my life and um <clears throat> it it like I said it really it really makes you feel like there's almost no circumstance ever in which that would ever be warranted um and and you know that that like that's like a that's like a flag in this in the sand that we that we need to look at and go that never again and so um anyway I didn't mean to totally derail us but you know I've been there and I've seen no, I brought us there. It's yeah. important. To talk and, about. I, and I've seen that shit and like, man, really fucking horrible. And you can even see the documents like they have like, I don't know if they're the original documents or like copies of the documents of like internal correspondence between between like American scientists and American officials like debating what they thought would happen. Right. And and like the devastation that dropping those bombs brought was significantly higher than their internal metrics thought. And so anyway, yeah, really horrible. <laughs> you know, there's a lot that you can do with that technology, but man, when it's used to when it's used as weaponry, it's really fucking scary. Yeah. Just 
glassed an entire city. Insane. So after he spent a lot of time um, being in this proliferation group, he even was the chairman of it and um, pushed for denuclearization of the of the weapon arsenals of the world. But he also joined the Brookhaven National Laboratory in Upton, New York. There he became, because he was a man of CAD expertise already, and what he did is he joined instrumentation division. What does an instrumentation division do? They prepare the instruments for experiments. So they are experts about taking measurements of all sorts, and they know how to assemble all the instruments into these big measuring devices. So he was an expert about he basically had turned from a physics guy into an electrical engineer. Do you maybe know a prominent measuring tool that is used a lot in electrical engineering? Maybe you, sometimes you see it in an, in a hospital. Sometimes it has this line on it, and sometimes it moves up and down. Uh, I uh, I'm having trouble visualizing this. When when something moves up and down in a in a rhythmic thing, it has a name, and that name also is the name of the. A measurement device. Uh, are you talking about like a like a heart rate monitor? Yeah, and heart rate monitor uses the same technology, and the technology is called like when something is oscillating, oh. and so the machine is called an oscilloscope. But yeah, okay. heart rate, heart rate monitor is exactly the same thing. And so these things are used in electrical engineering to uh, measure voltages or other varying signals that can come from electrical sources, and it basically depicted as this line, like you would like if you. Um, imagine a heart rate monitor just like that, but it can take all kinds of different shapes depending on how the electrical signal gets stronger or weaker. And these oscilloscopes are very present in electrical engineering and also pretty fun to work with if you are into this kind of stuff, you know? So William worked all day with these things because they are really helpful devices. And one thing that happened at Brookhaven once a year was that there's an annual exhibition and yeah, every day during this ex exhibition, people were led around the Institute and could check out what the scientists and engineers were working on. And though one might imagine that looking at all these cryptic machines wasn't really too exciting in 1958, so they wanted to infuse some action into that to make it kind of exciting. And just a few months prior to that, William was randomly reading this manual for a new computer he got in his laboratory. And the computer was called the Donner Model 30 Analog Computer. And he was reading this manual and it kind of was built for war purposes too. And he kind of figured out, okay, this thing can calculate rocket trajectories apparently. Okay. And he was like, this is, this is pretty cool. And then he was like, I can build something out of this that's fun to play with, to show the visitors, because they are always bored out of their fucking minds. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I just pulled up a picture of the Donner analog computer model 3500. Uh, and I don't know how to describe this to you out there, but I want you to imagine if you made a briefcase out of metal and then put a bunch of knobs on the like shorter side of it and then on the it's just covered in places you can stick wires like like imagine yes. imagine if you know like the little port that you plug your headphones into on 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 a, any old device right uh imagine if it was just covered with like 300 of those and just other assorted yeah. knobs and that is what it looked like it's insane to me a very modular device that you could hook into anything yeah. and what you maybe see it has cathodes sticking out of it um, because this is a non-transistor based computer this is a cathode computer and we know that the pdp1 for example the one that we claimed was the first mm -hmm. video game on was a transistor based computer so we are working with very different technology right here. right it's basically the predecessor to transistor-based computers. Yeah, and he learned that this thing was able to do something really cool, and that is just um, calculate trajectories of, of um, missiles. And he also learned that he could kind of calculate in that there's wind or air pressure and things like that, and that would change the trajectory. It was kind of like a neat computer. And if you hook that computer up to an oscilloscope, you could even depict the trajectories on screen. and on screen, it wouldn't really look like a missile, though, like a rocket, more like a ball bouncing around. So William thought that if he turned that into an interactive exhibit, it might liven up the place. 
to have a game that people could play and which could convey the message that their scientific endeavors have relevance for society. Because I, I think if you do physics, that's sometimes really difficult to explain to people why. I think you as, also you as a scientist also understand because even though you research society, nobody gets why you're doing it, right? That's actually a really important part of the the work that I do. And what I was taught and what I teach my students is, is you know, how do we apply this to real life? Like, what what does this mean? Why, do, why does anyone care about this? Why should you care? And so when I make my students write these lengthy research papers, a significant portion of that, like, is an importance argument to make your reader understand why you're doing this research. And so I, I think it's a really fascinating take to be like, ah, all this high level physics stuff. What, how do I make this fun, right? Like, what do I do with this to make this enjoyable that someone could come in and go, oh, cool, I can make the ball move, right? He's, he's not a guy that has any affinity to games, but lots of the modules that he needed to make it were already given to him. So we just had to assemble them. And so let's hear a quote from him about the process. It took me about two hours to rough out the design and a couple of weeks to get it debugged and working. It didn't take long. Since he already was part of the instrumentation division, he was the head of the instrumentation division. He could do whatever the fuck he wanted. He's just like Ralph Baer, who had this division under him that could just say, you, 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 you work for me now. Do this. <laughs> and they'd all just say, all right, Captain, and do whatever he said. And and since he was the boss, he could easily get some some work some some people some workforce to get into this i figured it out sorry you're gonna be like what are you talking about tyler i've been sitting here being like what the fuck does the instrument division remind me of and it reminds me of the human instrumentality project from neon genesis evangelion all right this is <laughs> this is my side thing i go i just i needed this for myself i'm nice go ahead it's good to that you got rid <laughs> of that bug but since he was part of that uh and he had a lot of expertise with building mechas and telling Shinji to get into the fucking robot. Get in the robot, Shinji. He, it, it wasn't too hard for him to um, connect all of those machines together. So he just slammed together those instruments with the help of a colleague called Robert Dvorak. <laughs> and they even built two controllers, like little handheld controllers made of aluminum that had um, a knob and a button. And interesting enough, this computer was not entirely transistor-based, as I told you, but it had vacuum tubes. Um, Those um, controllers were probably still more sturdy than a Switch Joy-Con. I have a picture of them. Wait, where is it? They, I have an entire video of the whole thing. I'll send it to you. It was basically the first computing device built for entirely the purpose of amusement. It was the first video game device. Um, but which game did it run? It ran, as you can see now, Tennis for uh -huh. Two. And it was a huge hit during the exhibition, so much that it was repeated during the exhibition of the following year. What do you see in the clip? Okay, I, I'm just really fascinated by this because I've seen, you know, we've talked about Tennis for Two off off screen before and been like, is this the first video game? Um, it's really fascinating. Okay, so how do I describe this to all of you? Imagine that there is a screen and the screen is just a circle. Okay, and mm -hmm. on the screen, uh, going through we'll call it the lower middle of the screen is a line uh, that goes the whole way across. And then there's like this little nub that comes out that I assume is to represent the fence. Mm -hmm. And then there's a glowing ball and it has like a trail, almost like a comet, right? And it oh, bounces yeah. back and forth. It bounces back and forth and the controllers are very rudimentary and it's literally just a knob and a button. And uh, you can see people playing it it's like literally like seriously it's just like a metal box there's a knob and there's a button just like a single teeny tiny nub and it looks like you just tilt like you turn the knob to adjust probably your trajectory right yeah. and then you hit the button to hit it and then it goes back and forth at one and point of the development the he wanted to add another knob so you could adjust the power with which you would hit the ball but mm. he then he, he even had the development thought of that is maybe too complicated and then he just um, cut it out because both of your hands are already occupied and he didn't think of a way to add another knob. But if you think of video game controllers today, they have a billion knobs and buttons. They do. So many widgets to fidget. 
so many widgets to widget. I don't even know all the buttons on my controller. I always, sometimes I turn controllers I have around and like, there's another button here. What the fuck was I missing? I was doing a speed run recently and I accidentally hit a button on one of my controllers in a way, like a controller that I don't use very often other than for this Mega Man speed run that I've been doing. And uh, it, for some reason, took both screens on my PC and zoomed them in like 600%. And I could not get out of it. And I was like, what the fuck just happened? Like, I was like 45 minutes into a speed run. And I just like, my whole PC zoomed in. It like totally shut down. And I'm like, what is this button? Why is this here? Who would put this on a controller? I still haven't figured it out. Imagine the controller design divisions of companies have grown so big by now that there's mm -hmm. trolls actual trolls hiding <laughs> within the divisions. And they're like, and they randomly add buttons to controllers and and program in weird functions just just to fuck with people what's this button here uh jim it looks it looks like a snake uh, i don't know r d put that in there just leave it <laughs> yeah we don't ask questions about that anymore <laughs> <laughs> this button here looks like my uh my mother-in-law just screaming why would i want to hit that one <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, but you were completely right. The knob is for um, changing trajectory, and the button that you hit is just for hitting the ball. And it's like you're looking at a tennis court from the side, yeah. right? Yeah, that's actually that. That's perfect. That's a perfect way to describe it. It's like a tennis court from the side, a very rudimentary one. Yeah. One thing that's important: you would have to keep score yourself. There's no scoring system in the oscilloscope. They they never implement that. That's interesting you say that because I was watching it and thinking, how do they know? They just, <laughs> they just don't. Remember. Yeah. But still, th something like this was never seen before. And it was a huge hit. After the second time it was shown in 1959, it was completely dismantled. Oh. And forgotten by history. It never showed up again. It was never published or spread or marketed or anything. No, never, no one ever sold that thing. It was only played twice for three days each so it was used for six days and then it was dismantled which is also one of the reasons even that is left out of the first video game definition because it wasn't very prevalent prevalence seems to be for some reason important to some people if it comes to video games but this is the definition thing we're having here where we have to agree on something and i don't think my personal opinion is prevalence doesn't play a role. It does not. I don't think that it does either. But I think that I would say that the PDP one feels not part of the definition, but it feels more like a video game because it was played and known. And, and it was spread a lot. It was spread all over the place. Right. But you're right, though, that just because someone plays it doesn't, you know, plays it more doesn't make it more of a video game by the technical yeah. definition, whatever that may be. Yeah. And sometimes it's with these technologies, right? You have to be, you have to invent them at the right time and you have to have the right thoughts about them. Like you have to be Ralph Baer, who, who at any junction of his life was like, how can I turn this into money? I know how to do this. Or you have to be like the PDP-1 guys who wanted to build this video game Utopia who were like, we can spread this all over the world. But this was just, this was William, and he didn't think of that. He wasn't the right person at the right time to turn it into a commercial thing because mm -hmm. he, that wasn't even, he didn't even have a, the slightest idea of that. Docs, I'm going to do something for you that you said that you wanted to do seven episodes ago, and I'm going to do this. No, Bear! Stop it, Bear! It's <laughs> November, Bear! You're supposed to be asleep! No, Bear! <laughs> Yeah, just like that. Bear would have sold the fuck out of that thing. No one is going to understand but what we're talking about. It's okay. <laughs> if you understand what we're talking about, send us an email. At, uh, <laughs> I don't know, whatever account we use to send Tyler hate mail. <laughs> CodexRexPodcast at gmail.com. Send me your thoughts, your yeah. questions, and your hate mail. Yeah. So yeah, but yeah, uh, I always think commercial success and how far a invention an invention spreads is a very incidental thing. It doesn't just happen, just, just because you invent something doesn't mean it will spread all around the world. We had steam engines in 100 AD and they just disappeared again. I didn't know that. Shit like that. But this is, by our updated definition, the first evidence of a video game. And it also 
kind of fits your you want to put the interaction thing in it right mm -hmm. it also it also would fit that if you would demand with it but i promise you i have an episode prepared where we talk about if video games need players i will give it to you and we will discuss the fuck out of that okay but not now but this one has interaction which makes tyler very happy it does but it it was forgotten right they disassembled it why do we know about this how how do we know of its existence well remember how ralph bear built the magna box and how they had this table tennis game mm -hmm. that looked on the onto the court from above that was it just it looked just like pong because atari plagiarized it and then there was this 10-year lawsuit where atari got sued for that mm -hmm. and the thing is that the lawyers of atari were trying to discredit the people that built the magnavox so what they did is they were looking for anything that preceded the magnavox table tennis game oh and, and who did they find they found william <laughs> and they were like oh, could you you have made this game and we have proof that you made it for these two times during 1958 and 1959 could you say this in front of a court under oath oh, so man. we don't get sued out of our minds <laughs> <laughs> um wow he did it he he went there and he just told them what he did he like he, he he had no agenda he just went there and told the truth like i made this game it looks a bit like table tennis and it didn't really matter because in the end magna vox won anyway atari got um lost the right to sell pong without playing magnavox a bunch of money but yeah this is how it all came up again it's because of atari's lawyers and also because some of the like children from new york that were around when there were these exhibitions they were grown men by then and they were in the 80s and they were kind of looking back or they had the same question as both of us like where does video where did the video games that we love come from and they remembered when I was a child, I played this video game. What was that? So there's um, articles were written in the mm -hmm. first um, video game magazines about William Higginbotham and about his the experience they had in the Institute playing that game during that one day in their life. And it influenced them so much that they remembered that for all of their life. And 30 years later, wrote about it in some magazine just to tell the world about it. So these are the two reasons we know about this. And this makes me think, you know, this makes me think, what if there is like, what if there's a game that's not tennis and thereby has not been dug up by greedy Atari lawyers? <laughs> because the te technology was there mm, since 1890. Computers or computer-like things, we had even much sooner with automatons mm -hmm. that could do logical operations so i'm i'm not sure if in 10 episodes i might not just prove myself wrong again because i don't know something comes up <laughs> but i find this very interesting well i think that there's no way to know for sure like like forgotten technology is forgotten and so we have no yeah. way to know if someone said oh i made this cool game hey larry look at this isn't this neat and then they went oh cool and then they went back to their jobs and never did it again like we have no way to know those stories um but i think it's okay to you know say this is the first video game as we know as as by our definition and and then if you know someday it comes out that there was an exhibition in 1955 and some guy had a different thing then we can do an episode on that but i think it's i think it's okay to to stand on to stand on this and say this is the this is the first video game as we know of it yeah in the year that william had to speak in front of the court for atari halley's comet returned oh yeah and he was able to see it in his lifetime yeah and he died 10 years later in 1994 he worked at that institute his entire life. He was in the Manhattan Project, being a fucking legend, mm -hmm. being in the Manhattan Project, which is insane. And then for the next 30 years, he did nothing else but electrical engineering in that institute. He was an interesting man. 
It really seems like it. And this is the story I wanted to tell. This is for Enamel. He wanted to hear about this man. And I found this very interesting to research. Do you have any final thoughts on our friend William Higginbotham and the definition of video games? I think that, you know, I think that, how do I want to put this? You mentioned at the beginning that you go on these long things about the history of people who made games. Um, and I really agree that that is the most important element of the games. Like, yes, games can have themselves can have this lasting impact, but, you know, it's, it's, it's the people who made them that made those games possible. And, and that's why a lot of these episodes are just, you know, stories about random individuals who sort of stumbled into video game lore for one reason or another and gave us what we have today. And so, yeah, I really appreciate this. This was, this was a yeah. really interesting take. It's kind of the story of what a video game is and the story of how a physicist with no interest in games whatsoever probably made the first one. And this kind of, this kind of, I like this. It's such random human human endeavors like i'm this guy built the atomic bomb and he also made the first video game right and that's really fascinating all the information i got about him i got from obituaries interesting yeah because he's he is a, pretty, a huge legend he's considered the grandfather of video games i could see that assessment yeah oh uh, well, let me find a picture grandfather of him. father of video games he looks like a man from the 50s on all the pictures. Thanks, Grandpa Higginbotham. Yeah, just look at that man. All right, let me see. He could he could stand next to Werner von Braun and Oppenheimer and fit right in. Oh, wow, look at this guy. Yeah, he looks like he would be incredibly boring to talk to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, um, man, it looks exactly like I imagined him, too. Um, just like right, right? a super <laughs> clean-cut, cropped hair white guy with glasses all right man well thanks this was this was fun hopefully all of you out there learned something i know that i did i'm really happy to have told the story i hope all of you stay healthy and have a good winter and we'll see you in the next episode yeah be safe out there friends we'll we'll see you soon bye